He didn't say much about heaven. But he told us how to live the life to get to heaven. So in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, pick it up at verse 42, down to 48. <clears throat> he starts off this discourse by using a phrase, little children, which really means in the Greek, young saints in Christ. So the first warning about hell is to the leadership of the church and the teachers who teach the church. <clears throat> there is responsibility to whom much is given, much is expected. And whosoever shall be offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a milestone, a big rock, a wheel, heavy, be hung around his neck and he will cast into the sea. He couldn't come up, he would drown. It would kill him, right? And if thy hand offend thee, and this is the radical part, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Amen? It is better to you to enter the kingdom with one hand than having two go to hell. That's what it means. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Isaiah 66, 24. That's what he's quoting. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better to enter into, into heaven with one foot. You won't enter. You will get a new foot before you reach. Then having two, go to hell. And hell is the place where the worm diet not, and the fire offend thee. And if thine eye offend thee. Now Jesus warns us, the three things we've got to look out for. Your hand, your foot, and your eye. Your hand to spend too much money. Your foot to spend too much time in the, war, in the mall. And your eye bigger than your pocketbook. Strange. When you see these lists in the Bible, you better check them out. Your foot, your, your hand, your works, your foot, your walk, and your eye. What you look at, you become. Amen? I have no doubt that SpongeBob wasn't something bizarre. Many people have looked so long, gazed into the glass of a, of a tablet or iPad or iPhone so long that I am sure in a year or two, their head will become square. Amen? If I'm a false prophet, you will have to stone me. But watch out for the square head people and them in the church. You know they're not looking at Jesus. And if that eye will offend you, pluck it out. No. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You see anything strange yet? Reading the scripture with your high ecclesiastical mind, your erudite intelligence. Do you see anything peculiar about these scriptures yet? Do you see 44, 46, and 48 is the same verse? Let me give you a hint. Holy, holy, holy. When things are repeated three times in the Bible, what's happening? Ah. Ah. Jesus is warning us this morning. He says in this scripture text, church leadership has a responsibility to the young ones. And if we use our intelligence, knowledge, or lack thereof to lead young saints astray, it would be better for us if someone put a big rock, milestone, to grind grain and cast it into the sea. That means to kill us. This is how important the weightiness he attaches to the correct teaching of God's word. 
This is why we have to be standing at the pillars to deliver God's message. It is never three points in a poem that might be good for a funeral service. It is always the truth of God's word to make, cause God's people to grow. Now the only person in the Bible who had a milestone, millstone experience was your boy Samson. Samson's punishment, Samson you know was a Pentecostal, <coughs> was that he would grind like an animal. The Philistines humiliated him daily. They put him in the basement of a building to walk around this grindstone, the grain in between two layers, to grind it fine. His only company were animals. This is the humiliation Samson had to undergo. <coughs> but they forgot God wasn't finished yet. And so we see, they had no guards. He's blind now. He can't go anywhere. They tied him. They chained him. And Samson alone, grinding. He's the only person who apparently handled a millstone and survived until he brought the building down. It shows you how serious God is how we deal with his younger children. Unless we handle truth, we are in trouble. This morning in the class, we started examining the basis of some of our behavior. I will not be popular. No problem. But I know where I'm going. I may not be liked, better still. Amen? I'll travel light. Amen? Amen? But these are the things you got to face. Truth is confrontational. And it will cause a whole lot of disturbance in people's life. Nobody likes to go against tradition. It worked for X number of years. Therefore, it will work again. Really? Has it really been working? This is the problem we got to face. <coughs> if Jesus were teaching this lesson this morning... He, instead of hands, feet, and uh, uh, eyes, he would have to add, it is far better to go through life without the internet, smartphones, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, don't forget Google, or having these things go to hell. Amen? This is what it's about. Jesus is contemporary, you know. He is with it. Amen? There was, a, there was a time, brothers and sisters, when men feared hell. And this was primarily the result of the preachers of that day. The preachers made sure they did what was done in the Bible and told people, you have to make a choice. Either heaven or hell. Hell is not a nice place. We see it described here for us. Where the worm doesn't die and the fire is never out. It is a place where worms eat you, eat your flesh. And fire is there eat. Eternally. And the last time I checked, and nobody came back to tell me, don't touch that. Amen? You better be careful. There's a story in the Bible where a man begged God. And he said, send them to tell my family. He was only self-centered. He didn't want to do nothing for himself. He don't care about nothing else. Send them to tell my family so they don't join me here. And then he says, what's the point? He says, oh, send Moses or the prophets. Listen to me. How long have you been in church? How many messages have you heard? Have you changed yet? You're trying to convince me? 
You can change when? After the service? This is the question we got to face. Huh? We need to evangelize ourselves again. And we ought to do that by praying as we're supposed to pray. Recently, I was reading a book on prayer. And you know, in the reference section, I can't find nothing written recently except prevailing prayers. And other books tell you how to pray. How to pray that somebody else pray. But the old time prayers, like the Old Testament, you took Hannah, for instance, you took David, you took Moses. That's not there no more. Amen? Because you walk around the desert with the sandals, don't mean you're obsolete. Huh? We got to understand, brothers and sisters, the principle is there. How many people come to a prayer meeting with a book of Psalms in their hand? <coughs> no. The church must give us chairs. They have no Bible behind the pew. You buy any? These are the things we got to do to get back in, pro in the progress. No. We call, you see, they preach like this. For every message on heaven, they preach three on hell. The ratio of heaven to hell preaching was one to three. Have we been doing that? Or do you want me to give you psychology 101, how to feel good about yourself? Answer simple, go smoke a weed. Amen? That's point one. Point two, have a drink. Point three, go to sleep and shut up. That's what we understand. That's what we come to church to hear. Pointers. We come to church to hear sermonettes, which only produce Christianettes, as per Derek Prince. So we have to be careful, brothers and sisters. These men, we call them fire and brimstone preachers. The most famous is Jonathan Edwards. Because of his message, sinners in the hand of an angry God. And if that message were to be preached today, they would run him out of tongue. Because they don't want to be disturbed, to be disturbed with anything about hell. But the same Jonathan Edwards once said, The most wicked, impenitent sinner in the world constantly assures himself that he will escape the judgment of God. Still tormented. And his one obsession is to get away from God. How is this going to happen? Today, brothers and sisters, we have made hell very accommodating. I remember as a younger man two years ago, when my children were small. <laughs> one year ago, what happened on a Saturday morning? You had the event of teenage ninja turtles. There must have been more. We drilled that into them. Never mind this uh, Tynosaurus Rex and Stegosaurus and all, all, all kind of us. Okay? Animals that God's vanquish. But we brought them back for our children. But all these bizarre images flooded their minds. And now, look at the result. We have the age of Voltron. We have Avengers to save the universe. Nobody wants God no more. Avengers can do it. We have all kinds of hocus pocus until finally we are accustomed to the living dead. Freddy is easy now. Freddy looks like a choir boy. Poltergeist is nothing. Huh? These are the things that have happened to us. We have been accommodating until this evil has overswept us, and now we are in trouble. Huh? This is it, brothers and sisters. You see, how does this happen? Very simple. We sat in the church and we taught. The carnal mind says, heaven and hell <coughs> doesn't really exist. So don't think about it, which served us fine. Sinners assume that they can escape God's judgment. In hell, there's the absence of God. So why should I worry about hell? I, can, I will gladly go there because I know God is not there. And we have told them hell is where God is not. 
So they are convinced that they are free in hell. Amen. In fact, I want to be, they will tell you, as far as possible from God. I hate God. Amen. But when they're in a jam, they want you to pray. And you let anything happen, the first thing they say is, oh God. Okay? No. Our language, our language, church people included, has made hell very accommodating. We use phrases as, war is hell. My life is hell on earth. And the best one, I think, my marriage has been living hell. Our children hear this. And they begin. If I catch so much hell here, you really think I'm going to catch hell when I die? So come on, death. Do your thing. That's the attitude. They always ask me, Pastor, do you believe in what the book of Revelation says, the lake of fire? My question is this. I always ask them, what do you think the lake of fire is? You think it's a big pool burning up? I say, no. Understand clearly, the Bible has many pictures of hell. The lake of fire is one of them. Either way, if you don't know him, that's where you're going. I always get a chance in my life to speak to people once. I don't know why they won't talk to me a second time. Some people believe that hell is a five-star hotel resort. And they get there on their frequent flyer miles. You better be careful. Do you know that in this book, he warns us about hell more than heaven? And this is why we ought to pay attention to what it's about. So first of all, he dealt with the milestone. Second of all, now, he comes to do with body parts. Look how radical Jesus is. The Old Testament... Uh, declared it to be a serious sin to disfigure your body which was a gift from God. Leviticus 19.28 But Evans, I want to run this, this scripture too quickly because they will gang up on me against this. You must be like lightning speed now. Okay? Rocky. What you need is lightning speed. Leviticus 19.28 Put it up. You have it there? Okay, I'll tell you. <coughs> you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh to put in cork or silicone for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord your God. Now you have ring in every hole. If you ain't got hole, you make a hole. You have mark all over the place. In your eyebrow, in your eyelid. Okay? Some parts you can't see. Some parts are unseeable. Amen? This is the problem. I once had a, a, an aunt, you know, who tattooed my uncle's name on her hand. Until like a good Trinidadian, she realized that uh, this was the many. He had others besides her. But her love for him was so great that she put her, his name on her hand. And every time she would look at it and cry, sweet memories. Sally had to work. So she went to the show alone. <laughs> this is the problem we face, brothers and sisters. It's what God said. Now, God said it. Don't bother tell me about it. Oh, but, uh, but Evers, take that down quickly, quickly. The Jews place a high price on the body. They believe it was a gift from God. The Greeks didn't care much about it. But Jesus is now telling a Jewish audience, it is better for you to disfigure your body than go to hell. In direct contrast to the law. Better to lose your hand your foot, or your eye, then having two end up in hell. 
what I ask you this morning is so precious in your life that is keeping you from the kingdom of God, from heaven? Is it your job, your money, your health, your education, your greed, your hatred, your unforgiveness? What is keeping you from God? Family members? Hmm? This is the point. This is what we have to face. This is the church now, full of everything except Jesus. What is so precious to you that you can give up heaven and hold on to hell? This is the problem. This is the question before us. The worst calamity that can befall a person is that that person ends up in hell. Are you following me this morning? I don't want us to be there. None of us have the right to go there. We have had enough word, teaching and preaching, to cause us to radically change. Biblically, hell has no end. Get this clear. You do spend five years and come out for good behavior. No parole. Okay? After five years, the devil won't put a, a monitoring uh, bracelet on your ankle and send you out on your own recognizance. Hell is a place of eternal torment. Once you end up there, you are there forever. Because you know, there is no audience in hell. In spite of what you've been told on the TV, there is no church in hell. There is no friend in hell. There is no family in hell. It is eternal judgment overseen by God and God alone. Because in hell, you are exposed to the wrath of God. You broke his law. Now you pay. Are you following me? Now you see why this is rough. The Americans don't like to hear this because our judicial system is corrupt and perverted. It is only for the rich who can get a good lawyer and get themselves out. You can't buy yourself out of hell. Very sorry. No money. No ATM. Okay? Biblically, hell is the ending point, the beginning and end. Of God's judgment. And I quote now Isaiah 66 and 24. They shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. When you look at them, parts of their flesh will be missing. Why? Because the worm has eaten it out. And since the worm cannot die, tell your neighbor, you got more flesh to lose. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is what it's about. Now, three times in Mark 9, Jesus told us, where the worm doesn't die, and the fire is not quenched. Whenever you see anything written in the Bible, and I gave you the hint, holy, holy, holy. The triagonon, which is, a, you, you have to pay attention. It is a poetic art form. They didn't have highlighters. They repeated it three times. And Jesus is telling us, listen to this message. Hell is not a place for you. Amen? When you hear it twice, like Abraham, Abraham, Moses, Moses, David, David, Simon, Simon, that is a term of endearment. I have prayed for you. Three times, it's a severe warning. Highlight, change the font, 
do whatever. We better be careful, brothers and sisters. <coughs> the following is a quotation from R.C. Sproul. And this is the history of 2 Kings 23, which I read for you this morning. During the reign of King Ahaz and Manasseh in Judah, the people became involved in one of the worst of all human practices, the sacrifice of children. The sacrifice occurred in a deep ravine, some people say a little valley, south of Jerusalem, known as the Valley of Hinnon, 2 Kings 23. <coughs> in Greek, this Hinnon is translated Gina, G-W-N-E, and the Aramaic is Gehenna, and that word was transcribed into our Bible. So when you see Gehenna, think now, 2 Kings 23, it is hell. The practice of child sacrifice was strongly condemned by Jeremiah, who began to prophesy in the 20th year of Josiah. The other prophet was there was Zephaniah. And finally, it halted in King Josiah to make sure it did not begin again after he died. Josiah began to desecrate the ravine, the valley, by turning it into a city garbage dump. Amen? They never build ghetto. They build garbage dump. The refuge from the city, including the carcasses of animals. Amen? Your pets. Tell your neighbor your pets. And corpses of criminals were carted out on a regular basis and tossed into the massive garbage dump. This is right outside the city. So you only got to do is go up on the wall of Jerusalem and look down on the south side. There you have the garbage dump. Uh, they, we call it garbage dump then. We call it now landfill. As if you're filling in the land to build some houses 20 years. When your house starts to sink, you begin to wonder. Amen? Good. To keep the garbage from overflowing, naturally, the refuge was burnt with fire. They lit a fire. And once that starts burning, you know, there's always all kind of paper and so to continue burning. Burnt with fire and constantly fed by incoming garbage. So you have fire, garbage, fire, garbage. So the fire never had a chance to go out. Amen? Meanwhile, worms were busy dis de uh, devouring. If you, if, if you make a, a, a money at home, you will know. They develop by themselves. Began, uh, were busy devouring the carcasses of the animals and criminals that were dumped in Gehenna. And since the worm had a constant supply of food, it looked as if it never died. <coughs> so he describes hell as a place where the worm never dies and the fire never ceases. And when you in hell, get this very clear, the only thing missing from you is your spirit. Your body is there and your soul is there. You can see, you can hear, and you're in this mess where worms are eating at your flesh and the environment is hot. So it is a place of total, absolute, eternal torment. Are you following me? Why are we trying hard to go there? This is a picture of a terrible place. Eventually, it became a metaphor <coughs> for the place of final punishment. Now, the Bible teaches not only is there a resurrection of the saints, but there's a resurrection of the dam to appear before the judgment seat in the white throne judgment. And if you don't make it through that, you go right back where you came from. Amen? Father, I can see that might be the only break. In hell, the worm doesn't die because the host is never consumed. There's always a fresh supply of carcasses, animal and human, to be eaten. In hell, the fire is never quenched. 
meaning the torment is constant. Hell then is a place of unceasing pain and of eaten flesh. Heaven is a place of eternal joy. Amen? If, well, Sister Maynard tells me she will live like another hundred years, so that's why I had to put this in there. If in a hundred years' time, Sister Maynard has just died, okay, and a few of the other sisters who have the same wish too, they want to outlive me apparently. That's all right. If in a hundred years' time, you have to appear before the Lord, what reason will you give him for allowing you to enter into heaven? Suppose he asks you, why should you come to be with me in paradise? Don't even think about telling him, I'm saved, sanctified, and talking in tongues. Don't even bring that up. Oh, I'm not making this up. It's going to happen to each and every one of us. After you pass the pearly gates, and you pass St. Peter, and you give him the high five, and yo, all your... Huh? Finally, you go to the throne and you see him. And he asks you, stop. What reason are you going to give me to let you go in any further? What are you going to tell him? Oh, I took care of my mother and my father. I bury all my family. I'm the best looking one. I love you, Jesus. You know me, God. Me and you. We tight. Really? He said, really? Tight, yeah? Watch it now. This is tightness. Take him away. All right? This is what it's about. You will have to go somewhere. If you tell me there is no hell and you're sending me to hell, then where are you sending me? Hell is a geographical place, you know. It is somewhere. Ask God where it is. Okay. You will be conscious in hell. You know who you are. You know your name. Ain't nobody calling you. So you really don't need a name. Who, who can call you? Hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, anybody calling you, wake up. Yeah, you will be conscious. Heaven is a place of eternal joy. Hell is a place of eternal torment where you will face the wrath of God. Now, this question about wrath, get this very clear through your head. God's, God is a holy God, a message we don't preach. God is a just God, a message we don't preach. You violate his rules, you will have to pay. Any violation is sin. Sin is what God hates because it is against his nature. Amen? When God says stop it, stop it. God says leave it alone, leave it alone. When God says pray, he means pray. When he says stop praying, he means stop praying. When he says come out from among them and be separate, he means that. <coughs> he means all of this. <coughs> and we cannot violate it. If you violate it, you have sinned against his holiness. And he will have to judge you. Are you following? Because God hates sin. I have tried to teach this church and tell them, you've got to love what God loves. Don't tell me about no dog and cat. They have no soul. Your pet pit bull will bite you and kill you. Don't tell me all this foolish about friends and family. Okay? Learn to live for God. This whole thing is about bringing glory for God's name. And when you have all this entourage around you, and your posse around you, and your homies around you, God gets no honor because you love them more than you love him. This is why you got to shorten now some of your list and stand squarely before God. You cannot tell God the reason I didn't serve you. 
as much as you wanted me to is that I had family commitments. He would say, really, you love them more than me? Well, take this. And instead of he take them where you're going. Huh? That's what it's about. You got to come out and be separate. I spoke to this church about the seven separations of Abraham. I don't give you this paper to decorate, you know. I said the blood of Jesus is upon this paper. No, it should be upon you. And that's what it's about. Now, Ephesians 2 and 3 speaks about you were before the children of wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10 And to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus that day was the propitiatory sacrifice. And you learned this this morning. When his blood was shed, he was taking it up to heaven. To do what? As our great high priest going into the ark there, into the holy place. Sprinkling it around the ark. Putting the rest upon the mercy seat, <coughs> which was now exposed. For there God resided upon the mercy seat. And when God saw the blood, he said, I will pass over you. When he sees the blood of Jesus on your life, he's going to pass over you. In him, there is health, there is healing, there is joy, there is strength. Out of the blood, you in trouble. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, the wrath of God was turned away from me. I don't know about you. You can sit there looking nice. Maybe I should preach this Easter Sunday morning when you have your big hat on and you can't turn. Okay? But because of Jesus' sacrifice, the wrath of God, I don't know about you, but I had a whole lot of wrath coming my way. I was born in iniquity and sin. Every day of my life was a day of wrathful, uh, uh, deserve God's wrath. There was nobody could do it, the evil, more than me and better than me. It, I, my rap sheet was long. But that day when he turned the wrath, because of Jesus, I can testify that Jesus dropped the charges. That's what propitiatory means. That's what propitiation means. And because of the sacrifice of his son, I no longer have to face the wrath of God. So I can come with boldness this morning into his presence and say, Abba, Father, your boy is here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Daddy, I'm here. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> How long? How long are we going to carry on the way we are carried on? Is it working? Is it working? That's the question you got to ask. If I get ready for the communion, have to lose my hand, my foot, my eye, or any other part of me, I would rather give it up than spend time in hell. The choice is worth it, brothers and sisters. Our hope is Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All on the ground is sinking sand. He paid the price to set us free. He paid the price to set us free from the wrath of God. And thank God, when that was done, he dropped the charges. Oh, love, that will not let me go. God bless you this morning.